The following conversation is a short and sharp one with my friend and colleague, Matthew White. We talk about all the adjustments that uh, we've all have to be making around COVID, Australia and and China, uh, relations and global politics. We talk about should people and athletes uh, go back to sport? And begin their seasons again. We talk about uh, Matthew's involvement in academics at universities and how they've all adjusted and what his thoughts and opinions are. And uh, the conversation centers around those topics. I hope you enjoy it. Um, We've been wanting to do this for a little bit of time. And now we finally did it. Enjoy. We were talking about the ramifications of reopening things, right? Do you think it's a, this is what should be happening? Do you think it's smart? Do you think we should be more aggressive? Do you think we should be more conservative? It's smart, yes, for the sake of... You can only do so much at home, whatever. If you have a home gym, cool. Stick with it, live with it, perfect. Um, in terms of being more aggressive, it has to be a balance. Aggressive, conservative, it's the same. It just has to be a balance. Like, yes, you have to be wary of who else is using the space, what other coaches have booked in, what other athletes or clients are coming in at that time. And then at the same time, you want to be aggressive because now's the time. People have come from being in isolation where they may have started working out or started training and they need some a bit of guidance. And that's where we come in. Mm. So it's just having that fine balance between do I ramp myself up, get as many clients as I can, add them into the system, or do I just slowly introduce everyone back into the gym that's already a client of mine and then do i start bringing in let's say one to two clients a week and see how that works with this is something you're considering and thinking about now oh yeah it's been happening for because we opened last week yeah so we opened last week and i know i myself gained um, clients Mm. i still had the original that was already there um, they were training out of my house over the period, but at the same time, once the ISO was over, I had interest come in, and I gained an extra five on top of already had. And yeah, it's just been a bit of a wild time just trying to organise it on top of just sharing the spaces with other coaches and their athletes. So, for example, someone who uses a semi-private model has, I'd say, half their space at the gym. Whereas myself, who's more one-on-one to two-on-one, um, I get the, let's say, a quarter to a third of the space. And I just want to balance it out. And it's not, it's fine. It's like, it's completely fine. We've worked it out. We're still seeing how we can shift some stuff around the areas because we have different areas. So like one, two, three, four, and five. So, and because I found myself now boxed out, on Tuesday and Thursday nights mainly, as uh. in from from four. <laughs> nice. Oh, sorry. That's all right. From four on to about six thirty, I've got six clients coming through. Cool. Which for me went from a one strictly one on one to semi private was a bit of a jump. So I'm still trying to get used to now making sure everyone's doing the right thing because as most of them being new clients, that one-on-one setting is usually preferred for them because they can learn, understand the movements, understand the program, understand what it's actually, what I'm going through with them. Whereas the more experienced clients who actually aren't on those days, which I wish they were, but then again, each their own, I just can give the program and go, cool, I'll watch you when you ask, but you're gonna be fine. Mm. They have the autonomy to do that themselves. So our, we were talking and you're like, man, let's do the podcast. It's all right. What did you, now that we're here, yep. was there something in particular? What was you? What did you in particular want, want to talk about and conversate? Was there something in particular? I've got a question for you. Yeah, okay. What do you we think about sports seasons mm. and them continuing on? I know a lot of them have been cancelled and canned. Mm-hmm. And some of them continue. But yeah, what do you and think? Starting back up. Yeah, what do you think of that? They've um, been delayed again. I can tell you from my experience. They've been pushed back again. What do you think? What do I think? I think when we talk about 
the benefit that someone gets to their mental health and physical health from playing sport and coming together as a team and socializing with people the so many benefits that there has that there is of sport i think that the i think the positives can outweigh the negatives but at the same time you have to argue the other side well you're getting up to dozens of people together and sport is something that is in contact so you're in contact with one another and so but at the same time we're looking at athletes they are typically healthy fit um people who are going to be much more robust uh, to uh, an immune system to fight against bacterial and viral infections so it makes me think well but they can spread and you can see i go back and forth you just keep going pinballing back and forth about arguing with yourself that feedback loop right and so i think uh I think if you look at it from a risk perspective, I think something like that should be classed in a similar thing to gyms, uh, that it should reopen and it should continue um, because the positives, I believe, outweigh the negatives, especially if you look at the individual itself. Now, whether the individual can pass on something to another person, that's, that's without being said, that's obvious. But I'm, I'm, I would say I'm on the side of full and against. Are you feel different? I, it's, I'm mixed. I want both, finally. I want the season to continue and I want it to stop. I want what, it to end. What's this? Because we argue the four part. What's the stop part for you? So I want it to stop because myself being with a soccer team, mm. being involved with that, we know most of the league has, is stopped. It's just, they're not doing it until next year. We're continuing however some of the teams that we compete against are in the those suburbs that have been in lockdown have now been in stage three again mm. so that's why we've been pushed back again so we were estimated to start mid to late july we've now been pushed back to nearly august because and for those who don't know matt's referencing matthew is referencing the fact that other suburbs have gotten do you prefer that either <laughs> um other suburbs in our, in our city have been locked down. So instead of locking down the whole state, our premier has locked down about 10 or so suburbs. Um, yeah. I, I think a bunch of postcodes are around the city. And you're saying your team potentially competes against some of these suburbs. Yeah, we know. We do, for a fact. Well, so that, that I, makes sense to me. I'm saying it. I understand that. So for the reason against, again, is that... And because working with a soccer club... And actually knowing that background, what goes in the back end. So not being part of the team, being part of the athletes where they don't know as much. Mm. Knowing the back end stuff where, hey, money's not there. Sponsorships aren't there. Players that will be wanting to move because they can't get paid to play. Um, coaching staff might change. Clubs get might, might get shut down. There's all these probability. And I put probability as a big word because there is potential for it to happen, and it, or it has happened. What? What are you talking about? What happened? Like players moving from oh. different clubs and all that stuff. Sure. But if we have the season to stop, yes, okay. I know for the players, and this is my four. I want the season to go on for the players. Yes. Mainly for them. Yes. And only them. Mm. Because I know for them, they've trained since. November, December of last year, they would have started competitions and th this again depends on what kind of league you're in. So for example, I'm, I will be referencing soccer a lot because I just know how it works. So if you're in MPL, so Premier League for Victoria, MPL one, they guys, those guys started end of February. So they've already played most of their games or well, not most, a, a good chunk. Three, uh, probably four games, I'm guessing, off the top of my head. Yeah. Whereas where I'm at in MPL 2, we only had one game that wasn't part of our season. This was part of what we call the FFA Cup, so the Federation Cup, which is a whole nationwide thing. So we didn't have a season game. So for the MPL 1 players, this season is a bit way through. And then it got cut off. So there might be a chance they might not be going on. Whereas NPL 2, we didn't have a single game. So I want us to play because we have the opportunity to do that so, and to do, this, to do so. 
because we haven't had a single game against a single team in our cl- so in our league. So I would say, yeah, let's play. But now, because of what's happened with the suburbs, I think you, you, why not just exclude the suburbs? Like you can, I think then it's, the, only, then it's only going to be four teams. I mean, it's better than no teams to me. Like as an as a former athlete, right? All I wanted to do was play basketball. I don't give a fuck who who I'm playing. Yeah, let's play. Some people not like that. Some people like, oh, I want to have all my, I want to have everything proper. Yeah, of course. But they yeah. just want to play. Yeah, from the from the players' point of view, they want to play. Yeah. For example, from the league's point of view, they don't want their shit to be half done. Pretty much. But guess what? This is a situation where you're gonna just have to adapt over the next year. Who? How long do you think this is gonna go on? I I said that this would ebb and flow, and it's where now we're flowing. Mm. Right now we're flowing. Shit's closed again. Then this thing's gonna open again. Then we're gonna close again. Right, and uh, you, we can say that with confidence because if you look at the disposition and of our leaders, and one of our leaders, our Premier Victoria, Daniel Andrews, his yeah. disposition is conservative. Yeah, he's not being aggressive. Assertive. No, he's not being assertive about it. He's, but at the same time, it's just like you got the leader versus the people. They can they can listen. It can shouldn't even be versus. It should be for and with the people, right? See, even that language is funny. Yeah, but if you think about it. And to use the estimate of, what was it? An estimated 70,000 70, people went to Chadston two weekends ago. Okay. If you think about it from that point of view where, cool, I get it, ISO, yeah, mentally challenging, physically challenging for some people, I get it. Mm. You want to go see people, you want to get out there. Mm. But the fact is that that amount of people had to be in one place over a weekend what was that in particular anything different or special because we're talking about one of the biggest shopping centers in the southern oh yeah yeah of course yeah like that's going to have a lot of people yeah but with the situation of how easily transmittable this is yeah it's a bit worrisome i I get it yeah it is the numbers would be concerning but uh i think i mean another two ish weeks and we're gonna see like whether something like that or even the protests manifest into something much larger because so far we haven't really had an explosion it's been pretty slow titrate up due to uh, partly due to an increase in testing oh yeah of course yeah the probability of increased testing to increased results and plus they take asymptomatic and borderline results as positive Mm. as well okay what does that mean what do you mean borderline results so even if you have a fever i can't remember the full symptoms of it but even if you have like a fever or a, a like a cough that's a borderline result. But you could just have like a common cold. That doesn't make sense. Th- they, they I, I don't know the exact definition, I'll be honest. I yeah. don't know the exact No, that's okay definition. because... But they take, test, they take a borderline Why result. would they count somebody who hasn't tested positive for the, the uh, antibodies or antigen for COVID-19? That sounds like that would be uh, appropriate to call someone positive. So why would you call someone positive if they just have one symptom that is similar? That is my confusion. I'm guessing to be... I Personally, I have no clue, but I'm just guessing it's better to be safe than sorry. Okay, well, that would inflate the numbers to be yeah. inaccurate. Um, and I just want to clarify, the antigen is a virus of bacteria that is causing the infection, um, and then the antibodies are pr- produced in response. So if you test positive and you're sick, you have the you get an antigen test, you're getting tested for the antigen, uh, or if you've had it before... And you're recovered, you're getting tested for the antibodies. But then again, it's the same as people who are asymptomatic. They don't show anything. Right. Hence, they're, they're either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, right? Yeah. So they haven't showed them yet or they won't show them at all. Yeah. Which is such a fucking weird thing. I know. It's like t- up to two weeks incubation period, sometimes more. It's like, ah, that makes this stuff more tricky and complex. Yeah. But I think we're seeing what I don't think many people anticipated. Well, maybe some did. The economical ramifications. Oh, yeah, of course. Holy hell. Like, all across the world. Mm. Like, our, I'm like, the, so our, our state government's going to give, if you have been affected, you have to close your business in these areas that have been locked down, you get another $5,000. We're going to match and give you a $5,000 check. Where are they pulling the money from? That's my question. Out of their they just gave every small business who makes more than 70000 <laughs> They just make, gave every small business making seventy thousand, ten thousand dollars checks. I want to give it for context of people listening who are, who are international. All right, guys, what is going to be the ramifications of this in a couple of years? Well, I guess that's why they sort of do want to keep everything open. It's because people need to spend more, so we can 
give out so they can give out more money somehow. I can see how that you want to put money back in the economy. Yeah. But it kind of works against their their <laughs> idea of trying to keep things closed down and trying to keep things controlled. And so But that's the thing. Uh, that, that that's exactly yeah, the thing. That's but the paradox or the, the, the dichotomy, the both sides of it. Contradiction. Contradiction. Yeah. And my sense is that you you sound you you probably do you err on the side of caution rather than aggressiveness or which way? That's my sense. I would say I would go in more caution. Yeah. It depend. It all oh, okay. Let me rephrase that. Yeah. On the situation, I um, will go with caution because, for example, for this kind of stuff, I can't afford to get it because my family members are of older age. Mm. So if I get it, they will have it worse than what I have. Yeah, that's real. That's fucking real, man. Whereas if it was a whole different situation, yeah, I'd, like I, I still, as soon as gym opens, I was just like, yep, yeah, cool, let's do it. Let's get everyone in, fuck it. Because we can do it safely, yeah, relatively. We can do it safely. Like you've seen- You do it reasonably. The materials, not the materials, the cleaning uh, supplies we have. Even I was doing it at home. So you can, you got like, my clients can trust me. Yeah. I hope. <laughs> no, exactly. But I think another big thing is that you know, people who I think how this is re- 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 we're reconditioning people because previously, if I've been under the weather, which is not very often, but if you feel under the weather, you might still go into work, right? You might still oh, yeah. go into do your thing. Yeah. That if anybody sees you sick, you're going to get called out by somebody. Yeah. Um. I don't know if you guys have it, but we've got a temperature reader. So At, no, we don't have that. <laughs> yeah, on, bro. we, we ain't that sophisticated. We literally have one just to scan, just for, scan for it. They're doing it. I, I went to a restaurant um the other day, and they did it before, to get into the restaurant. I had to, we had to do the, the scanner, hmm. and they scanned my girlfriend's forehead, yeah. and her hers was hot, and she did it again. It was red, and we were standing under a heater. Yeah, right. So I'm like, oh, she got, she, oh no. Yeah, and then you take it. Oh, I was like, couldn't get into. If that did red again, wouldn't be able to got in. I'm like, huh. This is this is the, this is what we're doing now. Well, it's the same thing at the um, squash center I'm a part of, because one of the employees got sent home because he came in high temperature, got sent home. I came out of my heated car and I just scanned myself just to why so not. That was re- it was and it said high, but I came out literally out of a 28 degree car heater blasting because I came hot. straight because I was going from somewhere to training or yeah. training to the gym, and I was just yeah walked in. I was just like there you go. I was like, I oh, know I'm fine, but the temperature reader says different, and it's the same. It's like some of my clients came in, they scanned high, just a one-off. I told them, okay, cool, let's try that again. Try it again, dropped. So just because of just being in a heated car, right, right, right. Well, the body temperature just regulates. Exactly, um, but the situation is, I may, maybe it's not as bad as we were anticipating? Oh, no, 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 definitely the second wave, I think, to call it a second wave. Yeah, I wouldn't really, but yeah. people do. The second coming, I don't know, this, this, the, the outbreak again. The uh, outbreak, sounds like a movie. I don't know how to pronounce it, I'll just clarify it, but yeah. I think, yes, there's been a boom in testing in those areas, yes, there's gonna be more results coming through that, of course, but I think because of that, it's showed us, us like, okay, we're now prepared for if it ever happens again, like oh yeah, th- like this this if it does, and I fucking hope it doesn't. That if it happens, we now know how to act. We now know what to do. Well, we now understand that. I think we are more prepared, but I think it's this has highlighted how ill prepared people are individually, at, at a population level. Oh yeah, at an economical level, nation. Yeah, like people's responses to stress and anxiety, uncertainty. Yeah. Are spazzing out. The fuck you spazzing out for, man? What do we talk about with Jordan Potts? It's not what happens to you, it's how you respond. Yeah. It's how you respond to situations is how others around you see you that way and how they might take you on board. Mm. So my first thing when I heard gyms were closed, I was like, okay, here we go. Yep. And the first thing I did, I contacted the manager and I said, hey, can I take equipment home? Not for, I, I honestly thought about myself, just to train myself, not even clients. You've been proactive, good. And that was my first thing. Cool. Like I didn't, like I was in a little bit of panic. I was actually more disappointed and let down that we had to close. 
But, yeah, I surprisingly run about it calmly. Good. But there's a lot of people who didn't. Yeah, of course. And don't. Panic buying. And so... It's like, you, you motherfuckers don't know nothing. I'm, like, I'm, not, I'm no expert on survival or preparedness, but... Huh. Let's think about the things that we need on a hierarchy. If shit really hits the fan. Mm. Like, I mean, like... Really? Civil unrest, chronically. Yep. Right? Like, they can't get food in, really, anymore. Like, like we're having to get emergency supplies from, like, uh, the, the, the military. Yep. I mean, that type of shit. You think you're fucking... You can feed your toilet paper to your children? Right? You best get a water filtration system. You best get an emergency energy power supply. Because what happens if it goes out? Learn to farm. <laughs> yeah. Get a vegetable patch. And it's good because it's sort of boom in, in, in uh, people buying seeds. I heard, which is great. That was that was actually pretty cool to see. That is positive. Let's grow yeah. your own fruit. Yeah, and in terms of the hierarchy, like, funnily enough, where did it come from? Where did what come from? The to- whole toilet paper thing. Like, where the where did that just come from? I think it's a number of things. Um, I heard on uh, one of the guests on Rogan that he made a good point, and it's like toilet paper is a large item. Oh yeah, and when you see it gone, it creates scarcity. Um, and so when something is scarce, it creates more psychological demand for it. Yep. And so that uh, just snowboarded and compounded. And so that made sense to me. Um, and now we're seeing the repeat again. And it just highlights how chimp-like we really are. Oh, yeah. Monkey see, monkey do. Oh, ain't that the truth. <laughs> chimp see, chimp do. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that should be the intro. Done. <laughs> chimp see, chimp do. Ooh. Cut, paste, <laughs> boom, next time, do it. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, but you said, hopefully it doesn't happen again. Hmm. I'm telling you, this shit's going to happen again. We're, we're in some form or another. And I tell every person who's come, who says something like that, I'm like, if we, i got a graph in front of me. It's like, oh, uh, you look at the history of pandemics. Huh. Swine flu. Yep. 10 years ago. That's 200,000. That was 10. Dead. Um... Ebola, that was 2014 to 2016, 10,000 dead. So I don't mean to sensationalize it by saying it's dead in like a dramatic way. I'm just emphasizing it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, MERS, 2012 to the present, that's nearly 1,000. Hong Kong flu in the 70s, uh, that was a million. And this was before Asian flu in 1950s, uh, 57, 58. And it's funny the names, right? You think they were saying shit about the names of these? Oh, you called it the Hong Kong flu, the Asian flu, the Spanish flu. Mm. And now, Trump calls it the Chinese virus and we all just lose our chimp minds. Interesting. Just found that interesting. HIV and AIDS is present to this day. 25 to 35 million. The Russian flu. And so I'm just trying to, and that was in the uh, late 1800s. Yeah. So it's like, okay. How are we going to prepare for the next one? How are you going to prepare, Matthew White? What are you going to do? Get a bunker. (laughs) It's not a bad idea, maybe. Get a bunker. Especially with all the tumultuous relations with China. Oh, God. Do you know much about that? I I know from from an education point of view, not from anything. Talk to me. Because most people, including myself, aren't very educated on it. Oh, it's stemming from... Where I work, and it's just like stemming from you. Oh, university. Yeah, yeah. As in, like, international st- international students have been discouraged to go come to Australia to actually study. Which which inter- let's be specific? Are we talking about Chinese international students? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. The Chinese government has encouraged or is discouraged international students to go to Australia to learn. Okay. Because of the investigation that. I think we asked for. Yes. So Australia have headed an investigation um, about the... Chi- the COVID. Yeah, about... I, mean, I just want to just Google it right here. Um, we wanted to do an investigation to figure out where the virus came from. Um, yeah. And we kind of stood up on our... Yeah, we started a movement. Yeah, we, yeah exactly. Um Okay, one month ago, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne told uh, that Australia would push for an independent international inquiry inside the outbreak of COVID-19. 
The Prime Minister went a step further two days later suggesting the World Health Organization uh, needed uh, tough new weapons inspector powers to investigate what caused the outbreak. Yep. So then that yeah. sent a message. You want to you go? Uh, well, you've got it in front of you. I think you should. The Fuhrer intensified after China's ambassador hit back by warning uh, warning of a consumer boycott and it was supercharged by China's decision to hit Australian exports of beef and lock in tariffs on barley. But one month after the first interview, the Morrison government has now emerged battered and bloodied. That's a bit sensationalism. From the diplomatic fray, clutching a piece of paper and declaring victory. What the hell does that mean? Last night, Media. the uh, World Health Assembly passed a European motion calling for comprehensive, independent and impartial investigation into how the pandemic started and the international health response. A record 137 countries ended up co-sponsoring the motion, giving it an overwhelming international endorsement. That's a sign. So, you know, it's a good sign for us for diplomacy and trying to yeah. find resolve and resolution to this problem. But we have one of the world's biggest leaders, China, who are retaliating by, politically. By pretty much saying, hey... You guys started this? Fuck you guys. You know, who do you think might have done the uh, cyber attack oh, yeah. on our Australian infrastructure? Did you hear about that? Yeah, a little while back. So we had, Australia had, a hack against their infrastructure. Yep. And... What was it like? The biggest, biggest attack? Yeah, in the Australian history, um, targeted all this, these organisations across a large, large range of sectors: government, industry, political, education. Um, uh, Morris has said the cyber attacks were ongoing, um, but he didn't give particular details. And we suspect, I suspect, it makes sense. China is on top of that list for who might have done it. <laughs> Oofed. I like how they stemmed off athlete. <laughs> <laughs> I just think about it like, wait, wait, how did this start again? Well, a conversation, it just flows. Yeah. It's like a river. It just keeps going. Yeah. Of course. I th Look, I think this may not be that interesting to you. Oh, no, no. It's definitely, it's just gone, it just goes back and back. It was just like backtracks back to there, backtracks back to there, backtracks back to there. But it, but it just shows that... um. Like, I guess if the world's asking for an investigation of how this started, maybe you should agree with it and just go hands up. But that's reasonable, Matt. I know, people aren't reasonable. Especially a communist-like Chinese government. Mm. Not going to allow yeah. anybody to come in there, snoop around their territory. Of course. So, I think you talk about... The pandemic. Hope it doesn't happen again, but very well might, and probably will. Well, uh, yeah, potentially. Hey, people just stay isolated. For in terms of Victoria, I mean, no, I mean ongoing throughout the next century. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, yes, of course. <laughs> History. Well, yeah, it's like hold on, it's like the flu. The flu. We can get vaccine for the flu, but it doesn't go away. But yeah, because it mutates and changes exactly seasonally, and so. I think, and I'm trying to get somebody on um, who is an expert in Chinese-Australian relations uh, about to talk about this um, because we don't know, especially our generation, younger generation, isn't aware of the ramifications of these geopolitical battles mm. that really can shift and influence how we all operate and trade. Yep. So, look, it's not, we're not trying to worry people, we're just trying to prepare people. Yeah, just to give them a heads up, like, hey, there is a good potential for this to come back. Which, which? Ah, oh, sorry, the pandemic. Right. And things to get potentially worse. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if a war started in the next one to 20 years between these countries. Oh, God. It's not surprising. How do you think it starts? It doesn't just blow up. It's one small yeah, yeah, step yeah. at a time, right? No, no, I get you, I get you, but just like... I guess the thought of that was just like... Yeah, it's heavy. Seriously? 
<laughs> it's heavy, bro. Suddenly, it, 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 imagine something like that happens. Because, you know, it's not like it hasn't happened multiple times before. <laughs> how that shifts your perspective like our grandparents like how that shifted their perspective mm. on something like that like all these pro this podcast no longer anyone's really giving a fuck about these stuff like this about you know what someone said to you the week before nah. what someone said on social media you know what you, your macros i want to i want to i want to i want i got my health and fitness goals and i don't want to hit them no, suddenly it's more like survival now. It's now like, okay, I gotta take care of my family, seriously. This is, this is like back to what actually humans were supposed to do. It's just survive. Survive and procreate, right? Yeah. Survive and reproduce. That's it. At the end of the day, that's our most primitive evolutionary. The last, well, it's stuck in our brain for millions of years what'd you say it's stuck in our brain for millions of years what just, just survival these, just survival right program. these imprints have yeah. you read sapiens no i haven't do you read much um i'm trying to get back into it i, I had to just stop because i think reading textbooks fried my brain for a bit well, especially like science human body anatomy like <laughs> bio like yeah human body science books they've they get heavy they get off. bloody hell and that's why I think we need to diversify our education. Oh, yeah, yeah. D don't get me wrong. Like, reading is probably one of the best things we can do because it gets us thinking. We can actually start changing vocabulary. Like, if you see a word, you think, oh, shit, that sounds like a good word. I might start using that. Mm. And then slowly integrate into your actual vocabulary and start using it every day. Yeah. You become better at talking. Yeah. Which is a skill. Yeah. And you can tell when people are very bad at talking. <laughs> and even saying that sentence is just an example of how sometimes bad I am at talking. Well, there are times where I just go, bleh, bleh. I just can't, I don't know how it works. I just know like what I thought up here did not come out. I wonder how much of that has been influenced by uh, globalization, cellular technology and, and being able to type or, or how much has helped. I think it's, it's also to add on to that as well as like also how rushed people are as well. Yes. So people don't slow down. They just go, all right, if I need to reply back, I'll reply back to you in like two seconds and like, there might be 50 mistakes in that message. But it's also, it's, it's also a note on how reactive we are. Yeah. Oh, something. Oh, I got a beep. I got a bling. Yeah. I got to respond. Yeah. I got a notification. Yeah. I got to look at it. Someone call my name. Hello. Who's this? Okay, thank you. Bye. Next, 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 yeah, next, and next. And just next. You become neurotic. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why like, even a big part of my coaching belief is just, like, if I'm, if I'm coaching yeah. and I need my phone on, on me just to make sure the clients are coming or if they're late, they're late. But if I'm coaching someone, it stays away. All notifications, all everything can wait. As this person has paid or invested in me. I have, I'm there for them. Yeah. Can you imagine if you're sitting in a doctor's office and the doctor just pulls out his phone while you're talking? What the fuck? I'll just walk out. Say fuck you. Just walk out. Like you're yeah. not you're not listening to me. But we don't we, historically, and I'm put my hand up. I did not hold myself to this same standard. Same. Right? You would check your phone every now and again. Yeah. Bullshit. I, I, I only changed um, start of this year. I think after just having that break from studying and just reflecting, I was just like, okay, that's why. That, that, not not that's why, but like, I can see where stuff may have gone wrong. Yeah, with your behavior of coaching, trying yeah. to improve it. Yeah, it's because was yeah. there a moment you remember? Um, or is it just moments? Just moments where I should be watching and just making sure that they're executing the movement properly, and just making sure that's alright. Like just making sure the client who has paid for me to do their programming and watch them to be there and not behind a fucking screen mm -hmm. cool there are times i record but i will let them say sorry let them say jesus christ let them know that i'm actually going to record and say hey that last set was sick i want to record this set now you have to i will cue you 
but I'm not going to be able to help you. No, that's imperative. You you need to gather data. You need to measure things. Yeah. You need to f- capture film. But that's the thing. Like, I will let them know personally yeah. before the set now. Because that's what a professional coach does. Good. <laughs> professional. <laughs> we do our best, right? Yeah, we try. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes we give us too much credit. Um, that's great. I, I've had my own similar experience with that, where mm-hmm. it's like you catch yourself. And I, 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 I've credited Jeremy Borzillo to being our great example of... Sick brick. Hey. Brixen. Jan Brixen. Yeah, he's the change. You be the change you want to see in the world. He exemplified someone who was very present as a coach, yeah. right? Historically, when I, I've seen him coach for years, doesn't check his phone. No. What the fuck am I doing checking my phone? Even, even when he trains, he does not check his phone. Yeah, he'll just have his music. Yeah, even um, when we train at Strength Culture as well, like, he just films. Yep. And then he goes... Focused. And just checks his program. And that's the only time he uses his phone. It's not a mistake that he's progressing so well. He's a machine. I respect him. Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've talked to Jeremy multiple times in this podcast, if um, anybody's listening wants to hear the illustrious, elusive... The brick. thick Italian man. Yeah, he's getting leaner though, which I have oh. much, much respect for, as you are. What's your, so what are you working on now with your health? Like, um, Okay. Keep talking. Oh, okay. Keep talking. Now, I guess being with... A soccer team now has made me shift and think and go, okay, maybe I need to look at myself as well. Like, I can give people the answers. I can give them programs. I can help them with exercise. I can help them with rehab. But from a presentable and professional point of view, I just don't feel like I'm up to a standard as well. Good. So... I've gone and gone to Jamie B from Melbourne Strength Culture. We started up this week, actually. New coach, new program. And it's all to do with athletic development because it means I get to learn at the same time I get to train, like an athlete, because I train athletes. So why can't I put myself in their shoes? Why can't I understand how it feels to be training at to use the quotations a professional level mm. because I work with semi-professional athletes how does it feel to be in their shoes mm-hmm. and I need to have that mindset like I need to understand like yes we train three times a week for now when it comes back to game season or game time we will train three times a week have games on that's four times a week just for the sport if they do gym training on top of that, let's say that's that's six, two days a week, that's six. So they have it's one. Typical. One, it's typical, and it, and it needs to be at that high standard. So I've thought to myself, not that I need to change the understanding I have. It's more to know how to replicate that feeling. Well, it illuminates. And highlights and gives you compassion and empathy on a different level. Yeah, because I now know how serious, how daunting, how tedious some of the training is. Mm-hmm. I prescribe it. I'm, I'm pretty much the first, the first case of the devil advocate. Devil's advocate for like, yes, I give you this because it's going to help you. But if I put myself through that situation, I can actually sort of understand. I don't know how tough it is. And this sort of comes back to like why I want the season to continue is because I know how tough it is for those guys to go through everything they've had and then just have to have this have the seasons just stop. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Honestly. Spe- especially if you want to play at an elite professional level. Yeah, especially we've got guy I think our youngest senior player is twenty. He just turned twenty. Mm. And he's come from New Zealand. To play with us. And if the season doesn't go on, I'm going to feel shit for him. Don't feel shit. Good. It's good. Use it as an opportunity. All right. But season got cancelled. Check. But. What are you going to do with it? This is, where I, this is where I want the season to get cancelled. Because it is a bit late for other clubs, for other leagues. I know for us, we haven't played a single game. It's fine. But if we just have this year null and voided... 
canned it completely, we then have this opportunity to work on everything else that's not to do with soccer. Physical preparation. Pretty much. Fi- Psychological preparation. Main, yeah, mainly physical prep, nutrition, and psych prep. Yep. At the same time, they can get, they can still do their soccer training, even though the season's not going on. That means they can work on their weaknesses. So if they have a weak foot, they can work on that. If we need to work on team tactics, tactics, we can now focus our training on that. If they want to learn about more about what we do, sort of that acceleration, the running kind of stuff, they can learn about that. They have this whole big, massive spectrum now they can explore from now until February next year. Exactly, and that's an opportunity within an adversity. Pretty much. And I know a lot of players are not looking at it that way. A lot of players want to have the season gone. Like a good example is we did a drill last night called the Argentina passing drill. It's pretty much bibs versus non-bibs or colours versus or jumper versus non-jumpers. And it's the first 100 passes. We had it contact. We told them semi-contact. But as soon as the first tackle came in, a lot of the players went wild. Yeah. It was the first time the in player. three months they could actually tackle, bump, sort of... Um, play their sport. Yeah, pretty much play their sport. And I get it. Like, you guys wanted to do that. You're hungry for it. But shit, that was crazy. Why? It was just like a whole different person or di- different players like the aggression just came out of nowhere they're hungry man well that's the thing like they're yeah, starving i get it i do get it but i was just like i was taken aback i was just like wow like okay this time is, to play this is how aggressive you guys are this is how hungry you guys are yeah careful about the mic oh yeah, sorry my bad but it shows me how much i want the season to go on for them yeah Good, man. But look, it's out of our control, right? Mm. You got higher ups. FFE for us. You got people in suits making decisions for who never even, even maybe touched a ball. Mm. You know, acting like they understand. Look, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, they, maybe they're experienced. Maybe they're empathetic. And maybe they know. But I think a lot of the times we have our so-called leaders make decisions for us. And they ain't on the ground. They don't know. I don't say it firsthand. Or oh, they for- have forgotten how it used to be. And this is why a guy like... You want to, you got to do something? Yeah, can I just... I'm just sorry. I'm just going to quickly message someone. Wow, Matthew. I'm sorry. Wow. Am I the first person to do this? Yes. Talk about distractions. How dare you, sir? Clients. Come on. Come on. All right, we'll pause it. Yeah. It, people making decisions who... To continue on, people are making decisions um, for other people who may not have that influence to even influence them. The players... Who knows how much influence they're going to actually have on making that decision. But you have to empower yourself. You, you, as a coach, you have to empower yourself. It's like, how can I get the most out of this situation? Yep. You know? And how has that been for you? How's the last, you know, three, four months for you? How are you taking advantage of this situation? So, you know, what, what have you been working on? What have you been learning? Well, Reflecting? At that time, I think I was working for the university. So we had to shift our systems completely online. So that was a big focus for us at the start. Um, I know I'm part of the coach development program at Melbourne Strength Culture. And I am also have signed up to um, both Luke Tollock and Eugene Taylor's, um, me- uh, not, not memberships, but... Like mentorship courses or yeah, something? Yeah, mentorships. Uh, yeah, I would say mentorships. It's good, man. Um, so I've got both of those to really focus on Nice now. Unfortunately, that three months where everyone was stuck at home, I could not take advantage of because I was working my guts out. What you, what did you spend most of the time on? Definitely the uni stuff. Marking, assessing. Marking, assessing. You did the on. So for those who don't know, people, what's your title? What do you? Um, I think the title is casual academic. Yeah. So it means I work with unit chairs. So people, so people who run the units at university. Yeah. And then I also demonstrate and teach. Got it. I don't lecture. Don't confuse that with lecture. Yeah. Good clarification. So you've been just doing like online lessons and marking. Yeah. That's been taking up your time? 
pretty much, and it only stopped until three weeks ago. What do you think of all the online stuff? Because, you know, I actually, I'm a quite an autonomous learner, you know, I like the freedom to be able to do things on demand on my own time. And I think it, make, it highlights the fact, number one, how redundant some of the uh, things we do may be yeah. and how you can actually outsource them to online. Yep. Number two, actually, you want to speak on that? I do agree. It does show you how lectures are the main one. Do not need to be in person. No, all. they don't need to be. They never do. I know... They can be. From the exercise science course I went through at Deakin. Yeah. Two to three units in my last year didn't have online lectures. Oh, no, didn't have in-person lectures. It was already pre-recorded and there for you to access at your own time. Now, pause. Why the fuck are you paying such a high amount and the same amount typically for that unit, even though it's all pre-recorded and their overheads are diminished? Once again, for exercise science in particular, you pay for the labs and the practicals. And? It's more content. Good. You pay for labs and practicals. So what happens when those units don't have labs and practicals or when there's a pandemic and they get sh shut down? You're expecting me to pay the same amount? You fucks. Really? Yep. It's thousands of dollars, man. I know. Look. I am you're, you're in the sector, so you can defend and you can have an argument nah, that nah. maybe I don't have. I'm in neutral. I'm in, I'm in neutral. Party. You're Switzerland. Pretty much. Ah, Guggenschlagen. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> Just made it up. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm for... Like, I'm for the students, like, yes, especially, and this goes from course to course. I don't know how it is in business. I don't know how it is in nursing. But from coming from someone who works in exercise science, online learning is literally the bane of existence for us. We've gone from being inside a gym, teaching the students different variations of exercises, programming, Variables, training variables, practical stuff, pretty much hands on in person practical shit. Yeah, to going online and talking through a camera and a slideshow, it is tough. But on hold that. on, so many units and lectures are already like that. Physiology, for example, it's very theory heavy. Functional anatomy, for example, well, actually, that some of those uh, assessments yeah. they had the hands on with you the practice, you had to have the hands on for that, that's functional. true. But there are certain units that are very theory heavy, right. Yeah, those uh, uh, have mainly online stuff. Yeah, which is true. But, but they also have the labs as well, which is where you put that theory into application so you understand it. Mm. And that was needed. Mm. Absolutely. I know for a fact that practicals this semester are going to be intensives. So that's a good sign. For Deacon. Okay. What's that going to mean? Um I don't know if it's, if it's for every unit. I know for the masters of EP because I've got a couple of friends who are doing that. Um, so the masters are going to do that. You don't know about the undergrad, not yet. Um, with the masters, there's just going to be like a week of intensive prax, smart, where they get it all done, and that's it. Just like you would do like end of year trimester three winter subjects type thing. Yeah, or summer subjects. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unless <laughs> the whole place shuts down. Who knows? Again. But that's the thing. So in flux. So I'm for the students into understanding about that point of view. Yes, online learning sucks for some. For some. Depends on the person. Depends on the person. I, myself, did not mind when I had to do the online lectures. It means I could learn at my own pace. Yeah. It's better than in person. But from being in the other point of view, the non-student or mm. the teacher, yeah. the amount of work that had to happen in the shortest amount of time we had was crazy. But this is what confused me a bit. The online systems were already set up. Yeah, so, the so what so other the work lecture, had to be done? So let's say, so all the online system as in all the slideshows, when we're talking about online systems, we're talking about slideshows, lecture notes, Video reading materials. Yeah, That's the thing. For those units who had prac intense, we were very heavily prac intensive. Yeah. We weren't prepared. The video, the video idea came in a couple of weeks. Did you pre-record or you do a live? We had to pre-record everything. So essentially... So, you, you and this is the first time this has happened, I don't know, for ages. Yeah. 
So a lot of units didn't have pre-recordings. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that's a big issue because now you have dozens of hours of content to shoot and shoot, editing. edit. And publish. Publish. You had to change all the assignments that were meant to be oh. practical oh, okay. into that's online. True. Yeah. That's uh, a lot of work. So there was a lot of work I can see why they the were charged. Oh, you know what? I would that could justify keeping the prices the same. It's very neutral. Uh, that's why I'm neutral. I understand both sides. Like the amount of work uh -huh. we that credit to the unit chairs had to put in. Yeah. I asked if they needed help. They said, "Don't worry about it." That's good. But the amount of time they had to do in order to make sure you guys or the students had the exact well, exact same amount of learning mm. was crazy. It's tough. And this was within. A week, a week and a half. Yeah, hustle up. So every hand had to be shifted down and back. Assignments were extended. Yeah. And changed. Yeah. And everything still had to get signed off by the head of the department, whether it was approved or not. See, here's the thing: university learning, it's such a big ship. Oh yeah. It's like a Titanic. So when you try and turn such a big ship in the ocean, it takes a long time, yeah. right? You have to go through so much red tape. I could ask this person, this person. The great thing about something like a certificate three and four, which I teach, is that, man, we got a small, very small, neat team. We can make such quick, autonomous decisions. And it's like, huh, you can see the benefit to having a, a little speedboat. But the ship is fucking huge. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got the content, the unit content does get updated every now and again. What does that mean? Uh, it does change. Yeah, it does. Over time. Like, over time. Fucking some of that stuff is pretty slow too. Yeah. Because that... Because it gets signed off every couple of years. Yeah. Um, but this is what I'm saying, that if they had to... And I think this was the case for one unit. They revamped the whole unit that this year. So they changed everything. Because when I did that this unit in university, in my degree... Until when I taught it now, completely different. It was reamped. It should be. I like that. But because of this, so up, you. It, because of the amount of work they had already put in, yeah, to prepare the semester for being on campus in person, add on top of what they had to do to make it online and electronic. It's a lot of work. Exactly. Prepare for uncertainty. can't do that all the time though. you can do that actually no you can do that all the time you can't live like that you, you can't, can't live, live like, in preparation yeah. you can't right? live in prep. i see what you're going yeah with. no you got to take action towards what you have in front of you at times too some sometimes stuff is sporadic yeah and you need it and you just need to react yeah like you could get a job interview the next day just mm. out of nowhere yeah for something you applied yep. for three weeks ago and I, you just have to prepare for that. I think the art of living, I heard this term listening to Hugh Jackman talk to Tim Ferriss, a beautiful phrase, the art of living, right? Yep. Part of the art of living is, is finding that balance of like, that. it's like dance. Yeah, you have, to, you have to go with the rhythm, but you have to be prepared for the unnatural Yeah. and oh, unexpected. Oh, that's good. You got to prepare for the rhythm. Is it, no, you have to, so you still go with the rhythm. Yeah, go with the rhythm. But you have to be prepared for the unnatural and unexpected. Yeah, prepare for the unnatural and unexpected. That's so true. That's such a nice way to phrase it. And I think that a big part of the art of living is listening, going with the, the flow, yeah. the rhythm of where the conversation's going to take us. Yeah, pretty much. How you talk to your clients or to your family and your friends. Mm-hmm. And how you absorb and reflect your emotions and your words onto them changes from from, from context to context. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that you being authentic, uh, it almost seems disingenuous and inauthentic to be. Oh, are you a different person around him and her and this? Yes, I am a different part of myself. Yeah. I'm expressing and highlighting and emphasizing different portions of myself. But all of those portions are should be authentic honest depictions and they make up me yes like you're gonna bring more energy generally speaking 
to a coaching session. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. Especially if the preference of coaching session is someone's doing a massive lift. Mm. People who haven't he- heard, and just for context, haven't heard me yell or scream yeah. will be taken aback for when I actually do it. Yeah, because you're a more... I'm a more laid-back person. Yeah, I'll let you bring, bring the words. Yeah, I'm a more laid-back... You take your time when you talk. Yeah. You're not in a rush. There's not a huge amount of energy coming at you. There's, I'm, I'm just here. Huh. How did you become that? Have you always been like that? Um, yeah. I think... And I'd probably like to thank my martial arts background. Mm. Was probably a big part of it. What did you do? Taekwondo. You still do that? No, no. I did it for, I think, 11 years, though. But enough for it really molds you. Yeah. What did that teach you? Just to know when and how to act to some degree. I, it's, I won't say I'm a, like a really top-class person at doing it, but if I need to change my energy and my emotion to fit the situation, I can. I would go, and this is how to reflect into this competition. Because of my last name, for the clarification, my last name is White. It's a blessing and a curse. Um, I was always last in our, in our stages. So in our comp, because I didn't do the actual fighting side, I did the more technical. So I did what we call pumse or the more technical patterns where we would demonstrate movements and clarity of those movements. Would it be like a c- equivalent to a kata in yes. karate? Yeah, pretty much. Exactly the same as a kata. And because of that, I would have to, being last, I'd say it's probably one of the shittest things. Because you're there watching everyone else, seeing everyone else's score. Mm. So automatically, your brain's already thinking, I need to get this to be in this position. How am I going to get this if this person's state team? He's done this so well already. Yeah. Uh. Mm. So... I would actually have to calm myself that whole time. And there was times I would wait for anywhere from half an hour to an hour, depending on how big the comp was. But then, to get more technical score when we were doing our patterns or our actual comp, we would have to show aggression with our kicks and our strikes and with our yell or our shout. So you had to switch from trying to calm your nerves mm. and then walk into center center of the mat. And we're talking, I think, a, usually a five by five mat with three judges in front of you, and two on the side. Mm. So you've got eyes everywhere. Yeah. Eyes are all on you, no matter where. To then going into that aggression state like switch, like a flip of a switch. Wow. Yeah, that's a great example. Then you really had to dance with the emotion. Yeah. And then as soon as you finish, you come back, breathe in, breathe out, <sighs> reset. Ground yourself. Yeah. Bow, thank the judges, walk off the mat. Wow. What a, that's a powerful experience. You really have to be in control. You can't spaz out. You can't have too much. You can't have too little. Because it will, it will pretty much deduct you points, mm. unfortunately. Did you find that you were naturally good at that? Or you really... It took time. You had to... What did you have to work on? The More of the aggression or more of the... Or something else? More of the aggression, definitely. Yeah. So you have this probably natural proclivity towards... Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm... If I could... Like, let's say if I could go... And we'll use the example for, let's say, our generation. If someone's to give me a absolute bend of a weekend over a night in with mates mm. so if I could go on a bender with my mates or a night in with my mates I'll choose a night in mm. chilling chilling just at home yeah quiet one dinner, doing whatever dinner small dinner and drinks yeah chill just have music in the back and that's it you know well that's good you're, you're self aware to your preferences and who you are have you ever felt pressure I've, I speak to Jay Edmonds about this I think Jay Edmonds um, I've done a podcast with him for those listening, he's, a, he's an example of a coach and a human being who much more quiet spoken, much more introverted, um, but effective. Yep. He's aware and he's effective at, at, at that, right? 
And you have powerful figures like the owner of this building, Christian Woodford, um, who I call the Kanye West of the music industry to give you guys an understanding of that type of personality. You know, <laughs> you have these... such a good description. Yeah, don't you think? Yeah. Polarizing. Yeah. Had his things with certain substances and mental illness. I would, I would go to far as to, I would go to as far to say that we're him and me we're polar opposites. Exactly. So when you see a guy like that, so successful in his own right, do I have to be like that to make it in this industry to be effective? I wonder. Do you, do you ever think when you were younger, you had to be and try and emulate someone or something else? To a certain degree, yes. Mm. I think we're all influenced by that. There's no change in terms of that. I think everyone gets influenced by a figure or person of their interest or who they're inspired to be. Yeah. That does happen, without a doubt. Um, I think in terms... I th- are we talking in terms of a coaching perspective? Or As a person. As a person? Yeah. Um, I'd say yes. I know I need to be more outspoken and just more louder because being calm has caused me to sometimes mumble yeah as evidence earlier before when you asked what did i say yeah um so just communicate improving your communication ability yeah yeah and that's how it's happened like i've more withdrawn i was more withdrawn and more a back like i more sit to the back but over time it's starting to creep forward i've started expressing louder to use that term yeah okay do you think I wonder because I think our well, look, another another good example is Brick yeah another great example is Jeremy yeah look, absolutely look how he came through the internship and I I've seen this guy change from day one mm. and it's been nuts and so I love it let's paint the picture we look at a guy who's overweight he's unathletic He's so quiet, you don't think he exists. Yeah, I didn't notice him for ages. I still love you, Brick. No, but no, but this is important because it's not who you. It's, it's like a Goggin story. Yeah. In in a, in, a, in a small like just a snippet, right? Yeah. Just like the, the the chapter one. Yeah. Because who the fuck this man can become is, I think, inspiring. Fucking oath. <laughs> who he's becoming is inspiring because now, he commands dramatically more presence. He is much more well-spoken. He is much more healthy. He's much more professional. The way he dresses, the way he presents himself. And that transformation a person makes is everybody's capable of. Yeah. It's just you have to find that niche. You need to find that cataclysm that inspires it. You gotta have a why and a reason. Oh yeah, that's pretty much it. That cataclysm is that why and the reason. Yeah. When you find it, you will go, oh, what's fuck? What's yours? Did you, when's that moment for you? I personally believe I still haven't found it yet. Yeah, that's okay. I know there's been hints. Yeah. I know the reason why I've gone into university work and still do the coaching is that it's a crossover of education. And that fulfills you. Yeah, I. I don't. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to put words in your mouth. What does it give to you? Well, we might as well take it. It does fulfill me. Like okay. I, I like seeing that light bulb mo- moment where students and athletes go, it switches on. They go, this is why this makes sense. This is how it makes sense. Now. And you facilitated that. You want, if you're facilitating I that, it's a powerful thing. Facilitate or encourage it. I yeah. don't want to give away the answer immediately. Yes. I want them to see, the, I want to see their brain tick. Yes. And tick and then go, click. There it is. And once it is, I will just be over the moon. Yeah. It's the same as someone doing a lot of dead... And I'm going to use this example because it recently happened. A lot of trap bar deadlift to what they're used to. And they nail the form every rep for every set. And it just looks like art. Mm. I would just be just silent. I don't cue. I don't say anything because it's just, it does not need me mm. in that. That's so good. You got to know when to pull back when it doesn't need you. Yeah. I think we get too verbose and too excited and too much. We try and be yeah, too we, much. We, we try and it's too, and it's, 
it, <sighs> it's sort of replicating everything how we can over cue people oh yeah if we over cue we lead to confusion yeah. we just know, need to know what cues work for each person individually and then watch it flow watch it happen i want to make a parallel to this to the to the to the to the real world for everybody else listening think about a cue like on a, on a movement right we're trying to give them one or two words to help them um, do something productive more towards what we want now think about a conversation you know if you're giving someone feedback or criticism there is an art to the way you communicate there is a certain phrasing and tonality that that is most effective depending on the person you're talking to yep it's finding that yeah it's just finding that for everyone and, and as much as it sounds a bit tedious everyone is different everyone's not the same we're all different individuals how we learn how we listen how we think how we understand how we process how we express that is all different once you find it it becomes great yeah and it sort of goes into the system of if you get a new client Get to know them. As a person first. As a person. Yep. They will, They are a client. Yes, they are paying for your services. But the first thing you should do is get to know them. You might not know them. They might just come to you out of pure interest. And what? Do you, do you want to be the first thing you do is just take them through every program or whatever you need we to do? We try and impress them. Yeah, you try and, you're just trying to say, hey, these are my services. Thanks for coming along. See you next week. And then you try and then throw everything you know about them down their throat. Everything you know. Yeah. You know, you try and position yourself as an authority figure. Hey, this is why we do this. This is what you do. This is here, here, there. Talk, talk, talk. Yeah. Too much. Yeah. No, I will sit back and go, just tell me about yourself. Mm. Who are you? What's your name? What's your backstory? What got you into sport? Yeah. Why do you... A conversation. Why'd you come here? Who Getting to know them. Yeah. We need to do more of that. That's pretty much it. Like we've done here. Yeah, man. Matthew White. Alex and Alice. It's not a... It's not the public profile name anymore. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's just my middle Bit name. Bit of a leak. <laughs> yes. People, if you know, you know. Um, any last parting thoughts, comments asks of the audience or just where people can find you if you want to leave um, them on that uh, um, I guess just take your time there's no rush it will come to you like everything work will come to you money will come to you don't go out seeking it yes you might have to seek it for some for a bit of duration but don't let it rush don't rush into it don't go I need to apply for 15 jobs to have a chance in this world you can do that but don't be this hardened if you don't get a single call back all right because failure is a part of that yeah just be patient see review and reflect how you happened how that happened what kind of what caused me mm. be progressive about it just take your time the world is rushing as it is we're too rushed <laughs> we want so much in such a short time and so we feel like we need to rush yeah your behavior how you act is an example i think of embodying that principle taking your time not rushing yeah. so i think you're a great example of not someone who's just talking about it but you're being about it i like to think so like hey i'm turning 25 this year mm. and i'm still not finished i know i'm not finished with studying i know i'm gonna go back finish off do one more degree what do you think it'll be physio masters correct very good maybe we'll talk again when that chapter opens Oof. a couple months it opens up we'll see be Matthew White thank you no thank for you for this conversation we finally got it done it took us time <laughs> but it's we good got it done it's good appreciate you where can people find you um at the moment, I've only got a Instagram handle. It's just underscore. I think it's... Hold on. This man's looking it up. He don't know. I, I, 
But God, if it's... He my, doesn't know his name. If it's my full name, I'd love to watch all... Oh, goodness. I'll put it in the description for people. It, okay, it's just underscore Matthew White. It's going to become my both my social and coaching Instagram. All right, Roger that. Thank you, Matthew White. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. No, it was awesome. Done. You are watching, talking, or listening to Talking Chimps. Do you expect us to behave? Do you expect a chimp to behave in a zoo? And how are you going to expect us to behave? We're in a fucking zoo. It's called the fucking planet. Spinning around in a marble, hurling through space, wondering when the fuck we're going to get off this ride. Never. <laughs> we're stuck. And we're in a Milky Way, which is in another universe, in another universe, in another universe, in another universe.